Talk to Memory this year will be performed by Jamie Mason. Jamie returned to curl with Toon Portland Curling Club in 2013 after 25 years away. He is also the founder me member of Cartoon Curling Club. And Liz, his standout achievement is coming 60th out of 59 teams competing at the 50th Cartina International <laughs> Curling Competition. <laughs> As well as curling, Jamie has a passion for music and is part of the Scottish Fiddle Orchestra bass section. He is also a keen coastal rower and swimmer. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our mortal memory tonight is Jamie Mason. President, lady presidents. Carlos, tourists, friends, eh, family, musicians. Eh, good evening. Eh, I'm sure you're all very excited to be, I'm sure as tourists, you're very excited to be here in Ayrshire, the birthplace of Scotland's beloved poet, Robert Burns. It's my job here to educate you a little, but also to set the bar significantly low enough that you enjoy everybody else too. <laughs> For an immortal memory, especially for our tourists, I will give a, a brief history, my interpretation of the brief history of Robert Burns. He was a lad. Aye, he was a lad. Um, and he, uh, Robert Burns inspired millions with his poetry, and his influence extends and is still relevant today in so many ways, uh, socially, politically and otherwise. Um, I'm going to run through a wee history around his birth and then I, I'm going to try and massage it around uh, his influence in America too. On the 25th of January 1759 in a cottage farmhouse on an extremely windy night Burns was born. On that same night to show my local history it was also the night that the Kirk roof blew off Crosby Kirk and Troon um, just in case which is near to the Crosby Curling Pond. It, it was a brief life, but little did we know that little did the people in that cottage down the road in Alloway know what an influence that this young, tiny child would bring in the brief 37 years of his life before his departure from this life in Dumfries. The young Robert grew up in a life of relative hardship and poverty, exaggerated by both himself and others in his later years. Uh, but it was a farmer's life in a cottage crofting. And his father, a far-sighted man, he was far-sighted enough to send him to an education, to school. And Robert was widely read. And by the time he had grown up, he knew major works of English literature and also a good knowledge of other subjects, including French and a smattering of Latin. And he was an erudite and cultured individual. He had considerable social grace and had undertaken dance and music lessons. In 1766, the family moved to Mount Oliphant near to, from Mount Oliphant to Loch Lee near Talbot. And Robert eh, was sent off to learn the art of flax dressing. And he worked in the heckling shed in Irvine, a building that survives to this day. His training in that trade wasn't a great success. And uh, Robert returned to Loch Lee penniless. Now, there's a bottle of Loch Lee behind the bar there, which is made from the barley grown by Jean and Gavin Morton, who are curlers here, Jean's president next year, um, and Gavin's away at the Strathcona Cup Tour. Another wee bit of local knowledge. Mm -hmm. However, perhaps this failure at the heckling shed actually did the world a favour, since it started to make Robert think about earning a living by his writing. By the time he was in his 20s, Burns had become an accomplished songwriter and poet and was showing a particular talent in his writing in native Scots. His father died in 1784 and he moved along with his brother Gilbert to a new farm, Moss, Moss Gale, near Mochlin. Burns spent only two years at Moss Gale, but it was one of the most settled periods of his life and he began to write prestigious, prodigiously. Even the most casual study of his work reveals a knowledgeable poet, knowledgeable about farming and the country and 
politics and his own social structures. While living on Musgill Farm, he met Jean Armour, who was the daughter of a wealthy stonemason who disapproved of Burns, particularly after she fell pregnant. And when she fell pregnant to Burns, the father refused to allow them to marry and took her away to Paisley. Burns planned to leave the farm and to travel to a new life in Jamaica with Highland Mary. Um, he bought his tickets, but the unexpected success of his first book of poetry made him reconsider this. And at about the same time, after the Kilmarnock edition was published, a book of 34 poems, chiefly in native Scots, um, the book was, it was well received. And rather than using this money for his travels, he took on, a, a, as a plantation manager in Jamaica, he cancelled those plans and decided that he would make money from his writing. The income from the second edition, selling more than 3,000 copies, allowed him to tour, which allowed him to travel to Edinburgh, where he was flattered by the Edinburgh li rich literary set, and he toured Scotland, um, allowing him to collect regional songs, write lyrics, and publicise his work and cement his relation, his reputation as a lyricist, songwriter and poet. Highland Mary at this time died of, she died of typhus and shortly thereafter Burns fell back in with Jean and they were reunited and after a turbulent relationship married. Uh, it was said by Jean herself that Burns ought to have twa wives. Um, and I think he often had more than one on the go, as we'll probably hear a little later. Um, he was a prestigious, prodigious lover, as well as a writer and lyricist. Um, he toured extensively, he loved extensively, and I shan't go into detail, because it, 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 I think in modern times we, uh, I think we frown upon these activities. But he was definitely a lover of the ladies. Around this time, he can, he, in Edinburgh, he began correspondence with Agnes McElhose, and she became the inspiration for A Fond Kiss, probably the most well-known of Burns' love songs, and most beautiful. Um, we'll hear it sung shortly after I'm finished by, uh, by Satnam uh, and the band. Now, Burns found himself unable to live on the proceeds of his writings and he went back to the land with Jean and their then four children to Ellisland Farm near Dumfries. The land was very hard work and Burns found it hard to settle into a routine of hard farming after his brush with fame and fortune. He was forced to take on a job and became a part-time exciseman um, and as a result, I think even though he had the job, he sometimes resented it. He wrote <coughs> poems like The Deals of Our the Excisemen, um, scorning in many ways uh, his own activities. This provided a meagre income and Burns was scarcely able to balance his part-time tax collecting with the farm. Uh, and the farm didn't do well. He gave up farming and concentrated his activities on work and on poetry. <coughs> He ailed, and after a bout of rheumatic fever, fever eh, and some dental treatment, he died on the 21st of June at the age of 37 in 1796. His funeral was attended by more than 10,000 people. Um, some years after, eh, Burns' friends from the Bachelors Club in Turbolton, which he had founded, had a, an event like, such as like we're having this evening. Uh, it was a bachelor's dinner with Haggis and the address to the Haggis was said and about five years after his death began the <coughs> ritual of Burns Nights which continued to this day. Now that's the history of Burns a little but his influence in America I'd like to touch on before the time runs out. Um, now not many people know <coughs> that Burns, or perhaps many don't, many do, he had strong links with the United States of America. Um, in 1786, Burns' work was 
widely, po wildly popular. Uh, it was reproduced by pirate printers in Philadelphia in 1787 and had a huge impact on many Americans. Among the poets, many fans were some of the most influential African American of the time uh, of the 19th century, Frederick Douglass, I'm going to focus on a little. And he was a man widely regarded as America's greatest. And also with Frederick Douglass, there was uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, widely regarded as America's greatest president. Both Douglas and Lincoln regularly cited the genius of Burns and used his philosophy of egalitarianism and the worth of all men to fuel their political campaigns. They used the words of a man's a man for all that often in speeches and in their campaigns. When Burns was, uh, <coughs> Burns's radical views uh, were heavily influenced by what he had learned of the US Revolutionary War and what was happening in the French Revolution. Uh, by the time of Burns' death in 1796 at the age at 37, he was becoming clear and he was understanding the, uh, the ideals of the independence and the declaration of independence and what was in it. The enslavement of the black people was endemic in the States and to that end, Douglas and Lincoln both drew in different ways on the works of Burns. Douglas started out as a slave in Maryland but escaped to the northern states in 1838 at the age of 20 and he began to make strong arguments as an abolitionist along with Lincoln. He spoke widely of Burns, lots of which I've got written down but I'm going to skip a wee bit because I appreciate that now we're getting a bit later, I beg your pardon. <laughs> um, when Douglas came to Britain he wanted to go to Burns Cottage and did so and he met Burns's then older sister there and Burns's two nieces. And he went back to America after that um, and spoke widely of Burns. Um, and Douglas, after that, on his return, his followers then bought him out of slavery on his return back to America uh, so that he was no longer a slave. Lincoln, he did pretty well okay too. Now, well, I'll take now to curling. Burns, he wasn't a curler, we don't think. He mentions curling in some poems. In the vision, he opens with these words, the sun had closed the winter's day. The curlers had quat the roaring play. The play goes on to describe a winter scene with curlers. <coughs> At that time, Burns would have been resident in or around Tarbolton, having found, having organised the Bachelors Club, and although there's no record of him curling, in the Turbolton Curling Club, there is a stone bearing his name with a date on it some years after his death. The historian, uh, Sheriff David Buchanan-Smith, who was a member here, writes uh, that the stone, and in fact it was part of his collection, and it now resides with the Scottish Curling Trust in Stirling. Burns also writes in 1786 a poem for Tam Sampson's deed. The winter muffles up his cloak and binds the mire like a rock. When the lochs, the curlers flock with gladsome speed. Why will they station at the cock? Tam Samson's deed. He was the king of the core to guard to draw or wick a boar, or up the rink like Jehu roar in time of need. But now he lags on death's hog score. Tam Samson's deed. It goes on considerably more, but it was to mock Tam Samson, who was there at the time, it wasn't, it wasn't an elegy, um, but it was an elegy to Tam to mock him at the time. Ta Burns's poetry was very much a uh, humorous um, and light-hearted at times, I know, but at others, deep, meaningful, with a social background to it, and often quite ranty, I would have said which I hope I'm not being tonight. Um, and I do hope that I can inspire you all and have taught you something. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, please be upstanding. The toast is the immortal memory of Robert Burns.
Thank you, Jamie, for your insight into some of Robert Bunsey's life. We are now lucky this year to have eight members of the, society, the Scottish Fiddle Orchestra to play for us and to have singer Satyrdham McElroy to sing a, a fond kiss and ye banks and braves. <coughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be playing my fiddle and singing for you this evening. Not that I thought you needed that translation, but I threw it in anyway. This song was written in 1791, and the lady in the song is questioning why the birds can be singing, why the river Doon can look so beautiful in the surrounding areas when her heart is broken. And she reflects on the times when she was very much in love and as happy as the birds that are singing in the trees, but realises that, sadly, she's never going to feel that happy again. You banks and braves of what you do. <coughs> Oh 
Next up to entertain us is Archie Gilbert. Archie curls and is an honorary life member of Douglas Curling Club. He has a, had a lifelong love of horses and horse riding and is a great supporter of riding for the disabled. Archie is also a past member of Wishaw Businessmen's Burn Supper Society, where he was chairperson for 18 years. So with his comprehensive knowledge of Robert Burns, I am sure he will enlighten us with his toast to the lassies. Mr Archie Gilbert. She has a knee, she has but yin. The cat is twee the very colour. Five rustic teeth for by a stump, a clap her tongue would deave a miller. A whisking beard with her moo, her nose and chin. They threaten her. She's boo hooked, she's hen shin. Ye limpin' legs a hon breed shorter. She's twist at right, she's twist at left, to balance fair on ilka quarter. She has a lump upon her breast, the twin of that's upon her shoulder. <laughs> now, <coughs> you might think out of all the bony lassies and burns his life, I could have got somebody a bit broader if I started a toast to the lassies. But I can assure you it's absolutely nothing to do with a toast to the lassies. It's just the fact that earlier the night, Jamie and I were discussing our first ever girlfriends. <laughs> and that's as near a dead ringer for his as you'll ever get. <laughs> Jamie, how delighted you must have been when Lisa came on the scene. In fact, that was the other thing he was telling me. We were talking about lockdown and things, and he said, uh, oh, you know, his son ever handled lockdown very well. He says, in fact, if it hadn't have been for Lisa, he says, I don't know how I'd ever have managed. He says, she come in one day and she says, listen, we'll need to do something about this. We'll need to try and get out of this rut that we're in. He says, what were you thinking? Well, she says, I read a lot of these books. And there are a lot of books there where there seem to be a lot of women and their patients are their doctor. And a lot of women seem to be having affairs with their doctor. She says, could we know maybe kid on that I could be the patient and you could be the doctor? <laughs> See how we got on. So Jamie thought for a minute, he said, right, I'll tell you what. He says, you nip up the stairs and get into the nearest thing you've got to a nose bottle goony and come back down and we'll see what we can do. So up the stairs she went, she appeared back down and by the time she come down, Jamie's standing there. He's got a white coat on, he's got a stethoscope around his neck and he's got a trolley set up in the kitchen. She says, you're fairly like getting into this, you know. He says, she says, what's the trolley for? He says, you'll ken just in a wee while, he says. She says, what about today? He says, you got up onto that trolley. And she says, and what are you going to do? He says, you got up there and you'll discover what I'm going to do. So with great excitement, she gets up onto the trolley and Jamie wheeled her out into the lobby and left her for 14 hours. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can I thank you most sincerely for your very, very kind invitation and for your wonderful hospitality. It's been a, a great night and I was sitting there and when they came round with the suit the night, it's strange how certain things spark you off thinking about things. Now, your chairman said that I'd been involved with horses all my life and I did and at one time I used to hunt quite regularly. You'll hear by my tone of voice how well I fitted into the hunting scene. <laughs> However, that I did. But uh, we used to hunt regularly with Lithgow and Stirlingshire Hunt. And the highlight of the year, highlight of the social event of the year, was always the hunt ball. And the hunt ball always started away with coca leaky soup and there were prunes floating on top of it. And I was sitting one night beside this very posh lady and in an effort to get one of these prunes, she missed it. And it skated off the edge of the plate and right down the front of her dress. She turned and said, oh, Archie, could you tell me, do prune stains come out? I said, well, I certainly hope so, because I've just swallowed two of them. Still on horse sale one day. The trade wasn't very good, but there was a very posh lady for the hunt and sold her horse. And after the sale, she came up and she said to the auctioneer, she said, I wonder, could you possibly tell me, did my horse go for dressage? She says, what was your number, madam? So he looked back, he shakes, he says, madam, at that price, 
I think there's more chance it went for sausage. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how many of you were involved in Ayrshire with the Eglinton Hunt or whatever, but uh, if you could just picture the scene, it's a Saturday morning, a really nice winter's morning, and sitting out in the middle of this stubble field is the, <coughs> the hunt master. He's sitting out there on a beautiful big bay horse, beautifully turned out, and along the side of the fence there's some hunt followers. So he signed for one of the hunt followers to come across. The man came across and he said, I wonder, my good chap, if you could possibly do me a big favour. <laughs> Boy, he said, what's that? He says, down by that gate, there's two ladies down there and there seem to be a problem with the gate. I wonder if you could possibly go down and assist them. Boy, he says, aye, I could. But he says, it's a fair walk down there and it's quite a mucky field. He says, you're up there on a the big horse, you could go down easier than me. He says, just a bit awkward, old chap. Turns out one of them's my wife and the other's my mistress. And I don't want to be caught with both of them at the same time. But I said, that's all right, I'm a man of the world. He says, I'll do that. So he sets off down the field and he gets so far down and he turns and comes back. But I said, is there a problem, old chap? He says, no, there's no problem, but by Christ, it's a small world, isn't it? <laughs> Delighted to have been invited to here tonight. In fact, I'm at a stage now where I'm delighted to be asked anywhere. But, uh, this year, I'm, I'm especially delighted that the burning season has started again and Christmas and things is by. We had a terrible, terrible Christmas. I come from a very, very traditional family, and it's not always a very good thing. In actual fact, my brother-in-law hung himself on Christmas Eve. Well, that was bad enough. But my sister wouldn't have let us take, take him down to the 6th of January. <laughs> but it is, it's, it's great to be here and to be doing a toast to the lasses with her or actually lasses present. I mean, a lot of burning suppers are all male affairs and it's, it's much, much nicer if there are lasses there to be speaking to. And I don't think, a lot of boys don't like speaking at mixed burning. I don't mind at all. And I think as long as you remember when the lasses there, if you just always remember that lasses always come in three categories. There's the good looking, there's the extremely good looking, and there's the vast majority. <laughs> <laughs> but Jamie and I were just saying it's strange how it's all the extremely good looking that are here tonight. <laughs> Uh, Liz Goldie, I'd leave replying to this toast. I was having a terrible job finding out anything about Liz Goldie. But I spoke to a man the other day and I said, Did you, do you care Liz Goldie? Oh, he said, I hadn't seen her for years. He says, I meant when she was in the Young Farmers. He says, I knew her quite well then. He says, she had a very unusual nickname. I said, hey, what was her nickname? He says, she used to be known as BBC One. I says, how did she get a nickname like that? He says, she was that easy to pick up. <laughs> It's great to be sharing this burn supper of the American Colours, <coughs> the, who happen just to be in Ayrshire, just the home of Robert Burns at this particular time. Now, I know that Americans in general have a great love of Robert Burns. In fact, there are more statues to Robert Burns in America than there are to anybody else. And <coughs> even, gentlemen, if you don't love Robert Burns, I'm sure that you do love the lassies, so hopefully you'll find something in this toast that you like and hopefully something that you might even understand. <laughs> Actually, understanding things is something that I'm now having great difficulty with. Things that all my life I thought I understood, and I no longer do. Politics. I used to think I understood politics. I don't know. But I'm not the only one. I had a pal and he said, as we lad had said to him at one stage, he said, see this politics? He says, how does this politics work? So the father thought for a minute and he says, well, put it this way. He says, see if we take it within the family here. He says, I'm the breadwinner. <coughs> so he says, we'll say I'm a capitalist. He says, your mother, she runs the outfit, we'll say she's the government. He says, the nanny, she'll be the working class. He says, we're all working in your interest, so you'll be the people. And your wee baby brother, he'll be the future. He says, that's how it works. Well, the wee boy hasn't a clue. Because away to his bed and through the night he's waiting to his wee brother greeting. So he got up to see what's wrong and he goes up and he realises that the wee fella has felt an appy. 
Well, it's going to get my mother. So he went away down to his mother. Well, his mother's in bed. But no matter what he does, he cannot waken his mother. He tries everything, but he cannot waken his mother. And his father's no there. He says, I'll go and get the nanny. So as he walks towards the nanny's room, the door's open. And here he looks in, and here his father's in bed with the nanny. Well, he says, I can't go in there. So he turns and goes away back to his bed. So when he gets up in the morning, he says to his father, he said, uh, See this politics? He says, I think I know how that works now. He says, How do you think it works? He says, Well, see, well, the capitalists are screwing the working class. The government's sound asleep, the people are being ignored, and the future's just left in the shite. <laughs> I think even even worse than politics is this gender recognition. Now what's that all about? I mean situations which have always existed and were never really a problem are now massive problems. I mean if anybody should ever have been involved in the likes of this, it was me. I had four big sisters. And I'm brought up in a time of hand me doing clothes. <laughs> You know, I arrived at the school one day in the same dress on as my geography teacher. <laughs> and I don't know who was best embarrassed, him or me. <laughs> you remember a song, K Sara Sara? Doris Day sung that song, Top of the Hip Parade. There was a verse in that and it says, When I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, What will I be? Will I be pretty? Will I be rich? Here's what she said to me. She says, Erche, get your sister's throat off and get away at the skill, would you? <laughs> However, I've been invited here today to do a toast to the lassies, and I'd better make an attempt at that. <laughs> <coughs> now, we've already heard a great immortal memory for Jamie, but when you think about it, that Burns no create an immortal memory to countless lassies, and that their names will never be forgotten thanks to the relationship with Burns. So I started wondering, now do Burns and I have anything in common at all as far as the lassies are concerned? Well, I knew that success-wise with the lassies, we were poles apart. But when I started looking at the important lassies in both their lives, we had quite a bit in common. Now the first two lassies in Burns' life, firstly there was his mother, his mother was Agnes Brune, and it was for Agnes Brune that he picked up his great love in music and song, and especially old Scotch songs. The second lassie in his life, although he knew nothing about it at the time, was Betty Davidson. Now, Betty Davidson was an old gangrel buddy, an old tinker woman that travelled the countryside getting a bed and a bite wherever she could. She paid her way by telling fortunes and relating stories of ghosts and witches, etc. Indeed, it was the same Betty Davidson who looked into Burns' hand when he was but a few hours old and predicted, he'll hear his fortunes great and small, but I have to bin them all and it'll be a credit to us all, and we'll all be proud of Robin, and how true that turned out to be. Now, when I look at the first two, they're the two most influential lasses in my early life. They were like Burns, it was my mother. And I don't need to tell any of you boys here today the effect that your mother had on you. The one person in your life that you could depend on, it didn't matter what your problem was, the one person that you could depend on to solve that problem would be your mother. Well. <clears throat> I had maybe a worse problem than most folk. I was a bad bedwetter. But my mother sorted that. She built me an electric blanket. <laughs> well, you can laugh if you like, but four nights and I was a dry as a blue. <laughs> and although I didn't actually have a Betty Davison in my life, the third part was taken by my granny. My granny was a fantastic old woman. Now, I was brought up in Liss Mahago. For any of you who don't know Liss Mahega, it's a beautiful wee fishing village just off the side of <laughs> I was brought up in Liss Mahega, and my granny had a pub in Liss Mahega, and I spent a lot of time in there, probably more time than I should have. Just to, just to give you a wee idea of what the pub was like, the two boys standing one night, and the one says to the other, he said, uh, see if I maybe had an affair with your wife and she maybe got pregnant. If there was a baby born out of that relationship, would that make us related? The other boy says, no, that would make us even. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I can best find in my granny's pub 
It was the last pub I ever saw that had stuffed boxes in the pub. The miners used to love it. There was a lot of miners in West Mahega. And they used to say the snuff was great, clearly cleared their tubes and everything else. Well, snuff was losing its popularity and my granny couldn't get stuff and she had to put the boxes away. She didn't like the idea and she was never easy beat either. So there one day she's out there in the main street in Liz Mahega and she's cleaning away at the windows of the pub. And she looked down on the pavement and here sitting in the pavement was a half-dried dug shit. She says, here, that might be the very thing. So she went and got the shovel and she lifted it, took it into the fire, got it dry, crushed it up and put it into the snuff boxes. So she put the boxes back out. And there two of the boys come in at night. The boy says, here, there, there's snuff boxes back out. It's time for a go at that. So the boys up and... Stunned for a minute. <laughs> Pal says, try with you. She says, no smell dog shit. <laughs> she says, no. She says, well, I can smell it. She says, no, my shoes, it must be yours. <laughs> no, she says, no, my shoes. So they have a couple of drinks and the bubble leather and everything else and they're getting ready to go. And the second boy says, I'm going to go at that snuff, he says, before I go away. So he's across to the box. He says, I'm going to tell you something. He says, that without doubt is the best snuff that has ever been in this pub. That doesn't half clear your tubes. He says, I can smell the dog shit now as well. <laughs> Obviously, my granny's long since gone, but I'm delighted to tell you that special lassie in my life is still my mother. My mother, God willing, come the 2nd of June, I'll be 103. She still stays on her own. She stays on her own in Liz Mahega, and I could tell you a thousand stories about her, but we'll get a wee mention before we finish. If we go back to Burns and her teenage years, as far as the lassies were concerned, could hardly have been more different. The 15 Burns was taking an active interest in the lassies. His first attempt at rhyme was a song written for wee Nelly Kilpatrick. Nelly Kilpatrick was his, his neighbour in the harvest field. And it was for Nelly Kilpatrick that he wrote Handsome Nell. Says she dresses ice and eat and clean, both decent and genteel, but then there's something in her gate, cos only dress. Look well. There you are, 15 and started a love song. Now by 15 I had never ever looked at a lassie. And worse than that, none had ever looked at me. <laughs> that was hardly surprising because my whole life I've been wee and ugly, but I couldn't do much about it. <laughs> but it's strange, but it doesn't matter how bad things are. There are very few things that don't have a good side to them somewhere. I mean, see, even being wee and ugly. When I think back now to when I was a teenager, and you used to go to a party and you'd be sitting in a circle and they would spin the bottle. And if the bottle pointed to you, the lassies had either to give you a kiss or give you a pound. I owned my own house for the time of the <laughs> But I did, I did have an experience with the lassies before that that Burns never ever had. I had a lassie as a school teacher. Burns never had a lassie as a school teacher. Now, I went to the school in Liz Mahega. As I say, I tell you about Liz Mahega, you'll always can if you're going past it. There's a roundabout there and there's usually a sign hanging across it that says, uh, Happy 30th birthday, <laughs> Granny. <laughs> and, uh, I, went to, I went to the school in Liz Mahega and it's funny when I think back now. See all the great things at the school. See all the things that you never really appreciated at the time. See when I think now, See the idea of being spanked regularly with a middle-aged woman? <laughs> it's the kind of thing I would pay good money for me. <laughs> but I can remember sitting in the class at Lister Hager one day, and the teacher said, uh, I wonder if there's an end could give me a sentence with the word substitute in it. We last doing the front says, Miss, Miss, last weekend I was picked for the school netball team. I was not involved in the begin to begin with, but I was later brought on as a substitute. She says, that's just perfect. Wee boy down the front says, Miss, Miss, my ma's a substitute. The wee boy beside him says, That's rubbish, your ma's a prostitute. The wee fella says, No, my sister's a prostitute. But see, sometimes if she can't manage, the boy's a But the, the lassies in Burns' life were many. 
<laughs> the bells are moth when it says Miss Muller is fine and Miss Metlin divine, Miss Smith she is wit and Miss Betty is bra. There's beauty and fortune to go with Miss Morton, but armour for me is the jewel of them all. And armour, of course, was Jean Armour, who you all know became Burns's loving, devoted and long-suffering wife. That's another thing that we've got in common. We've both got wives that were far too good for us, that's for sure. Having said that, <clears throat> I did my best as far as my wife's concerned, but I seldom seem to get it right. <laughs> when we used to go away on holiday every year with two or three of our pals, they would go away abroad, and I mind one year <clears throat> she was away, and first night she phoned back, she said, how's things at home? I said, aye, fine, aye. She said, you sure? I said, aye, fine. She said, I think there's something you're not telling me. She said, I don't you're telling me the truth. She said, is everything all right? Well, I said, your cat's dead. I oh, she just put the phone down. That was it. Never heard her all week. Picked her up at the airport, coming back out for the airport. Things were very, very quiet. But I said, uh, well, how was your holiday? Thanks to you, it was ruined, she said. I said, how? She says, well, that first night when I phoned and you told me the cat was dead, she said, that just ruined my holiday. Well, I said, you insisted that I tell you the truth. She said, you didn't need to say that. She said, you could have said, the cat has gone up onto the roof and I can't get it down. But it's okay. The next day you could have said the cat's still up on the roof. I've been up and fed it in water, then it's fine. The next day you could have said the cat's still there, but I'm going to phone the fire brigade and get it done tomorrow. <coughs> and then last night you could have said, in an effort to get the cat down, the fireman as he went to lift it, the cat got away from him, went over the edge of the building, and it killed itself on the pavement. And she says, then I would have been coming home the next day, and my holiday wouldn't have been ruined. I said, oh, I never thought of that. That's your problem, she says. You never think that's your problem. So she's away in holiday the next year. She phones back. She says, how's things at home? I said, aye, fine, fine. She said, are you sure? I said, aye, aye. She says, aye, there's something you're not telling me. I says, well, she says, come on, what is it? I says, well, your mother's up on the roof. <laughs> influence in Burns' life as far as the lassies were concerned must surely be seen in his love songs. Too many to mention and we've all got our own favourites. Well, this was fair and that was bra and you're on the toast to all the tune. I sighed and said among them all, the Ernie Mary Morrison. Hugh McDermott, who was probably the best Scotch poet since Burns, Hugh McDermott thought that these four words, your Ernie Mary Morrison, were the most descriptive words that were ever written. Had we never loved so kindly, we've heard already. Had we never loved so kindly, had we never loved so blindly, never met or never felt it, we would ne'er be broken hearted. Burns his part in love song to Clorinda. Clorinda was Mrs. as Michael and his Burns his wee bit in the side in Edinburgh. Oh, the earth's the wind can blow, I dearly loo the west, for there the bony lassie lives, the last that I loo best. This was one of around 15 love songs, or songs in general, that Burns wrote for Jean Armour. It was written when Burns was living in his own at Ellisland, he was building a new farmhouse there, and Jean was still staying in Mochlin, and he was looking westward, and he was thinking to Jean. I wept there in the cold blast, by yonder lee, by yonder lee, my plighty to the angry earth, I'd shelter thee, I'd shelter <coughs> thee. <coughs> this was written for a lassie called Jessie Lures, and young Jessie Lures helped Jean nurse Burns in his final illness. So there you are, Finelli Patrick to Jesse Lures throughout his life, how empty burns his life and ours would be without the lassies. My own favourite, John Anderson, my Joe John, when we were first acquaint, your locks were like the raven when your bonny brow was brent, but now your brow is bald, John, and your locks are like the snow, but blessings on your frosty bow, John Anderson, my Joe. John Anderson, my Joe John, will climb the hill together. And money I can today, John, we've spent we in another. Now we one totter doon, John, and hand in hand we'll go, and we'll sleep together at the fit. Anderson, my Joe. What a lovely pen picture of love throughout her life. The joy and beauty of youth, the love and companionship of middle and old age, and even in death itself, when we one totter doon, John, and hand in hand we'll go sleep together at the fit. John Anderson, my Joe. Love in old age, that was something that Burns never knew anything about. Died at 37 and never knew old age. 
But <clears throat> it's not a bad time in your life. In fact, I was across the list of Hagee just the other week. And I met a boy that I'd been at the school with and I hadn't seen him for years. And I said, how are you getting on? He said, I'm getting on great. I said, how's life been for you? He says, life's been great. He says, we've just no long celebrated our golden wedding. I said, did you do anything special for it? He says, we did. He says, we managed to get booked up at the hotel we'd been at our honeymoon. And he says, we've got the same room and everything else. So he says, we've got our breakfast delivered up to the room the first morning. He says, brought it in, we're sitting doing this, and I said to my wife, is this not just fantastic? Just exactly as it was 50 years ago. Same room, same sea view, breakfast served. Well, she says, mind, there was a wee bit different. She says, what was that? She says, mind that morning when they come up, we still had the door locked. And she says, they had to leave the breakfast outside. And we brought it in, but we were sitting here, we were start making when we were at our breakfast. He says, well, see if that'll make it for you. We'll just do that the new. <laughs> so he says, we've got our kit off, we're at the table. He says, and she ran across the table. She says, David, I've got the same warmth in my breast for you the day that I had 50 years ago. He says, I'm no surprised one's in your porridge and the other. <laughs> be upstanding, I said that I would tell you a wee bit more about that special lassie in my life, from my mother. As I said, God willing, come the 2nd of June, she'll be 103. She stays on her own in Liss Mahega. She's a fantastic old woman. I go across and see her as often as I ever can. I was across the other day and she said, uh, speaking anywhere this week? I said, aye. I said, actually, I'm at air. I'm at air on Monday night. She says, you're going to wait through air to a burn supper. I said, oh my. She says, See, when you're at these things, she says, see when you're finished. She says, do the folk all get up and clap and cheer and things? I says, well, that's always what you're hoping, but it doesn't always work out like that. She says, what time would you be speaking? Oh, I says, it might be half past nine, ten o'clock, somewhere about there. She says, well, see you on Monday night. I'll just be sitting here in my cell at ten o'clock, and I'll be thinking about you. And see if I thought that when you were finished, all they folk would get up and clap and cheer. I would be a very, very happy old woman. <laughs> so, I'm not asking you this for myself. <laughs> but if you would like to be an old woman of 100 years, you'd be very happy. You'll get your chance just in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Gentlemen, can I now ask you to be upstanding, charge your glasses, <coughs> and whether that special lassie in your life be an Agnes Brune, that would be a mother. An Elico Patrick, that would be a sweetheart. A Gina Armour, that would be a wife. Or for the very lucky amongst you, a Clorinda, that would be somebody else's wife. The toast is still the same. A lassie. Thank you very much. This year comes from Liz Goldie. Liz comes from one of the curling families within the Air Curling Club with three generations all curling together. She has been a member of the Donald Curling Club for 50 years and is a past president, secretary uh, of the Donald Curling Club. Liz is currently chairman of the board of Ayrshire Curlers Limited and works tirelessly to keep their rink going. She is also grandmother to a piper, Fergus, so ladies and gentlemen, Liz Goldie. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, how do we follow that? Fantastic, thank you, Archie. And uh, I've just got a wee poem that's got absolutely nothing much to do with Burns at all, but it's written by a friend and I thought might just entertain you. So I'll try and do the best I can. So first of all, who needs a man? When things go wrong, you men report it. 
but not us lassies, we just sort it. A man is just a mammy's boy, born to bring her lots of joy. And then one day he takes a wife, thinks he's sorted now for life. Where's my this and where's my that and have you seen my woolly hat? Ah, uh, even when they're in good fettle, they can't even boil a kettle. <laughs> and feeling down and when they do, we have colds, they have flu. <laughs> and we are hardy, we, we are able to put the food upon the table. Men see meat and they can eat, but seldom say it was a treat. Us lassies give them all they've wanted, but men, they take us all for granted. Aha, but times are changing, help my bob. Lots of lassies doing men's jobs. Even football, so it seems. Lassies winning in top class teams. Us lassies like to let you ken, we're just as good as any men. However, if the truth be told, I think I have been rather bold to say things I've said of you. Do we need you? Yes, yes we do. <laughs> when we get in a muddle, you'll be there to give a cuddle. This is what it's all about. You'll be there to sort us out. So work it out if you can. Yes, us lassies need a man. So we we'll be upstanding girls and drink the health of our laddies. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Orchestra to play a couple of songs. Thank you.
John Mason, and James Barner, who founded and with the inspiration behind the Scottish Fiddle Orchestra back in 1980. It was called Willie Kidd's Welcome to Orkney. Now, Willie Kidd was a much-loved founder member of the Scottish Fiddle Orchestra, played the accordions for many years, and sadly died last year. I think the old miss a great deal. And finally, back from Orkney, so that's how we now you're here to work as well, and I'm going to ask Jane to come up and maybe lead us in some community singing. We're going to sing some songs, play some waltzes, you should know most of them, and I believe you may even have the instructions to hand. That's right, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> there are, there are song sheets on your tables. If anyone doesn't have them, they should be spares. But uh, you should know most of these words anyway. Okay.
available over there. <laughs> Next, Simon Lamb will perform the, the poem Tam O'Shanta. Simon is a primary school teacher, poet, writer and performer. In 2021, he won the Robert Burns World Federation Poetry Competition with a new poem, The Working Birds. He has also a new book of poetry and illustrations coming out in the spring of 2023 called A Passing On of the Shells. Ladies and gentlemen, Simon Lamb. Good evening, a pleasure to be back with Air Curling Club after first performing here at a burn supper eight years ago, which I can't believe, it seems such a long time. I also at the moment am the... Shall we do a wee dance? <laughs> I'm also at the moment the writer-in-residence at the Robert Burns Birthplace Museum, at a role called The Scriba, and I believe the teams that weren't playing, I think you got a visit down to the museums yourself, and I hope you really enjoy being on my home turf. Tam O'Shanter is a particular favourite poem of mine, and because I noticed the people that I've spent all night schmoozing with, I noticed they've done a runner at this point. So hopefully, <laughs> while they return, let me give you a sense of what the story is in English. Tam is a bit of a roguish lad, he's been out working all day, and before heading home to his darling wife, Kate, who says, if you stay out drinking, I'll not be held responsible for what happens to you. He goes out for a wee drink with his pals down the pub. <coughs> and he has quite a few drinks with his pals down the pub, so that when it comes time to leave, well, he's a wee bit doddery on the way home on his horse as he's leaving, as he's leaving. And all of a sudden, he can't believe his eyes. Because through the trees, through the trees he sees Kirk Alloway on fire. Well, he thinks it's on fire, but the closer he gets, he realises it's not actually on fire. It's lit from within. And there's a dance in there. And the dance is being held by old Nick, the devil himself. And in this dance are all the creatures for hell. And lots and lots of witches. And they're dancing away. They're having an amazing time. <coughs> now Tam's had a wee bit to drink at this point, you know? And he gets this eye for one wee witch. Come on, come on. <laughs> All night we would chat each other up and what did you do? You dumped my friend. <laughs> He's had a wee bit to drink and he sees this one young witch. And the poem just wouldn't get written today. He sees this one young witch and he's like, ah, hello. And he loses all mind of himself. And he shouts out, Well done, Catty Sark. <clears throat> Gone yourself, short skirt. And at that point, all the lights go out. And he thinks, Oh, help. Oh, jinx. And he does a run up on his horse. Now, even if you don't know the poem, this is generally the bit you know. You see, Burns gives this line of, Witches cannot cross running water. So they go to the River Dune and they head over the River Dune and just as they're heading over the River Dune, oh no, oh no, dry at the last second, the horse's tail is grabbed by the leading witch and Tam makes it home safe. But the horse is tailless. Tam O'Shanter is a very famous poem and I think it's a fab one. Thank you for inviting me along to perform it, and I'll dedicate this performance to our guests, who I hope are having the time of their lives here in Scotland. This is Tam O'Shanta. <coughs> when Charm and Billy's lead a street, and drew the neighbours, neighbours me, as market days are wearing late, and folk begin to tack the gate, while we sit boozing at the nappy, getting few and unca happy. We think nah on the lang Scots miles, the mosses, waters, slaps and styles that lie between us and our haim. Who oh, are sick to a sulky, sullen day. <laughs> gathering her brew like gathering storm. Nursing her wrath to keep it warm. Well, this truth 
Find honest Tam or Shanta. A sea free air and nectar canter. All day when their tune surpasses. For honest men and bony lasses. But, do you have time? A market net. Ooh, Tam had got planted. Uncorrect. Fast be an ingle. Ooh, blazing finely. Me. Reaming swaps that drank divinely. And at his elbow, oh, suit of Johnny, his ancient, trusty, droony, crummy. Tam loved him like a bit of bread. They had been food for weeks together. The night they band we sangs and clatter, and I, the ale, was growing better. Kings may be blessed, but Tam was glorious. Or are the ills or life victorious? But pleasures are like poppies spread. He sees the fleur, his bloom is shed. Or like the, the snow falls in the river, a moment white, then melts forever. Or like the Borealis race that flit, ere you can point their place. Or like the rainbow's lovely form, a vanishing amid the storm. May man can tether time nor tide. The ur approaches, tab. Moon ride. The wind blew as twould blow on its last. The rattling showers rose on the blast. The speedy gleams, the darkness swallowed. Loud, deep, and lang the thunder bellowed. That neat a chill might understand. The deal had business on his hand. Wheel mooted on his grey mare Meg, a better near lifted leg. Tab skilped on through dub and mire, despising wind and rain and fire, whilst holding fast his good blue bonnet, whilst crudded up some old Scots sonnet, whilst glowering round we prudent cares, lest bugles catch him unawares, with glamouring through the groaning trees, cut how I was. In a breeze through Elkabor, the, the beams were glancing and loud resounded mirth and dancing. They ventured forward on the lectern. <laughs> Tam saw an unpleasant. Warlocks and the witches in a dance and they got to the opera new play France. But hot pipes, jigs, the spades and reels put life and metal in their heels. And a winnet bunker in the east. Oh, there sat old Nick in shape of east. How's he tight? Grim. Black. Large. To give them music was his charge. He screwed the pipes and guard them scuttled. Till roof and rafter are to Darrell. Oh, as Tammy glowered, amazed and curious, the mirth and fun grew fast and furious. The piper loud and louder blew, the dancers quick and quicker flew. They reel, they set, they cross, they click it, till Elke Carlin, oh, swat and reek it, and coos her daddies to the wark, and link it at it. In a sack. <laughs> now, Tam Kent went with Foo Fe Brawling. There was I, Winsome Wench and Wally, and who Tam stood, oh, like Yim Bewitched, and thought his very een enriched, till first I came out, oh, sin another. <laughs> Tam took his reason all together and rose it. Well done, Gatty Sark! <gasps> and in an instant, <coughs> all was dark. Now, here we lee old Rabbi Burns. Her tale. It takes some twists and turns. See, this is the truth of what happened to Tam. This is the tale, according to Lamb. See, all was dark, aye, that was true, and I, he witches, fairly flew. Tam revved his horse up into gear, and to the river Dune did steer. 
Tan kent that witches couldn't stand water flowing across the land. But when the river did appear, oh, it forced our Tam to shed a tear. See, it was the fair. It was the nice. A river dune was topped with ice. <laughs> <laughs> it whipped the grin for Tammy's face. Oh, was this the end of the epic chase? No chance. For see this blazing parlor, <coughs> O'Shanter Tam was a champion cuddler. <laughs> <laughs> An idea flashed into himself that brought a halt to hordes for hell. He said, look here, my witchy friend. I challenge ye to play an end. And if I win, I will gan free and I will tack me mare with me. But if ye win, upon departing, you'll hear a sign photograph of Rona Martin. <laughs> So, which confirmed we are motley set, said, OK, son, we'll tack your bet and victory will likely snatch in this old Nick's outdoor grand match. <laughs> but Tam, Tam was the yin fella. Can you guess what happened next? I'll tell you. He, he dark was split by sudden light that gave the witches awe a fright and through a Blinding beams they spied a bus emblazoned we earnside. <laughs> a bus emblazoned we earnside, a vehicle stopped beside the river, and twenty men it did deliver. Who <laughs> all had come to save the day, these heroes from the USA. <laughs> Stepped the bus's stair and Leland Rich said, Put it there. My friend Tam, oh, you can count on us. I got a whole dang team on this here bus. There's Doug and Doug and Doug and Steve. There's Ken and Kent and Craig and Keith. There's Michael, Michael, Bill and Brett, whose luggage fiasco we'd rather forget. There's Gregory, Wayne, Roger, Chris and Sean and Jeff to help with this. We'll play for you and help you, Peter. Oh, and where there's Scotch, there's always Peter. <laughs> This one night, we'll combine our powers, but the Harry's Maxwell trophy's ours. <laughs> and thus, the stage was truly set for a deal's bond spiel they'd ne'er forget. The ice was peddled and inviting. Oh, in mood was tense, but quite exciting. Leyland went first, as head of a pack, and proudly stepped up Tee the hat and chose a stain of Scotch design and wished it luck for Auld Lang Syne. Across the ice, the stain went leaping. They used the witch's brooms for sweeping. <laughs> the overswept, oh, the stain went loose and travelled straight on through the hoose. Oh, the witch's gleeful glee they hid. You completely missed the big pot lid. <laughs> It's time you did surrender before you lose this game, eight ender. <laughs> Next up, the witch slid her stain, and oh, what happened did cause her pain. She clipped it with her magic brush. The stain became a chicken, lush. The demon bird let out a howl, and that's what you call a stain gone foul. <laughs> to deliver a stain and good yes Sally got it hame but we hers the witch did skate and ching she let gaity late she travelled past the old hog line new Tam was smug and feeling fine is that a rule that you've no learned you see your stain's been rabby burned <laughs> <laughs> and say they played into the night we both teams putting up a fight. 
But in the end, the winning play was claimed by Tammany USA. Oh, they did. They sang. They danced with Tam. And Peter doomed another drum. <laughs> they celebrated Mekti the Proud. And their mascots, they were Mekti Proud, said Teddy Roosevelt and Charlie Brown, we knew you wouldn't let us down. Well, it's more to say. There isn't left much more to say. We've still not had a famous clutch. Say, I'll amend this odd exclusion and tack this tale to its conclusion. Tam, victory lapped upon his horse, but he witches when he done, of course. Oh, they were raging, fit to burst. Alas, the mare would come off worst. If the Tam they are did sail, we curlin' carlin' on the tail. Oh, poor Maggie, Tammy's mare, she curled her fingers, ruined his hair, gave yen sharp tug. The tail came loose. Oh, and Maggie turned a shade of puce. The witch aloft a shriek did send. And thus you see, she stole the end. <laughs> the USA were most distraught, said, we'll charge you in our curling court for thieving a tail. It simply astounds. Pay up to we share it. 25 pounds. <laughs> Tab, T witches, most dismated. Oh, her stains were fairly played. We won a game and say I say, stun back. And let us on our way. But then he witch picked up and said, Please, dinner lay us here. Instead, tack us we are. We were having fun. Our love of Caroline's just begun. We were having a blast. We were having a bar. We've seen that Caroline is. For all three witches that night, they'd witnessed a bond between Tam and his pals fray across the pond. They'd seen that this game, both ancient and nice, is a game about <coughs> mere than just stains on the ice. Mere than winning or losing or being resilient. It's a game called curling. And it's pure deed brilliant. <laughs> Come on. Come on, said Tam. I'll buy you a drink. And we those words, they all left the rink. The Americans, Tam, a whole hellish club. And they kindled a friendship. Dune at a pub. For if no abu friendship, then was abu. It stains on us, we memories en route. May Harry's Maxwell be filled, we love, joy and banter. And say concludes, Ur Tam O'Shanta. <laughs> this year. Tommy is a retired agricultural machinery salesman and as Tommy says he can sell sand to the Arabs. So he thinks. In his retirement Tommy plays curling, lawn bowls, 
and does after dinner speaking. And tonight, when I asked him, or the other night when I asked him if he would do the speech, he said, uh, how many hours does he want me to speak for? <laughs> so, <clears throat> it could be in for a long night. So, hold on tight, it's Tommy Wilson. I'm away, hey, my goody foley that. <laughs> Tremendous. Yeah, I've some uh, breaking news before I start. <laughs> There's a football match played tonight in Darville. <laughs> the result was Darville 1, Aberdeen 0. Yeah. Jim Goodman's there looking for a job. <laughs> now, a year past the Easter, I hadn't been keeping too well. So I went to the doctor and he says, we better be at the hospital for tests. So a fortnight ago, I actually got a place and it was in two weeks ago for last Easter. So I'm wired up to all these machines, up to the monitor, a mask in my face. And after two or three days, this nurse is in checking me out. And I, I says, boss, is my testicles black? She says, pardon? I says, is my testicles black? She whips the covers back, she says, no, they're perfectly fine. I says, no, I took my mask off, I says, is my test results back? <laughs> <laughs> now, I see Billy Howitt over there, uh, I've been friendly with Billy for years, you know, and Sue said to him the other night, no, Billy, we've been married 20 odd years, he says, uh, how would you describe me? So Billy thought for a minute and says, your A, your B, your C, your D, your E, your F, your G, your H, your I, your J, your K. She said, what do you mean? What's all that about? He said, well, you're adorable. You're beautiful. You're cute. You're delightful. You're elegant. You're foxy. You're gorgeous. You're hot. She smiled and says, that was absolutely lovely. He says, what about IJK? Billy says, I was only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we had a great game of curling today against Brett Jackson up there. And as you know, these guys are staying over in the Western House Hotel. And Brett was down asking the receptionist a question last night. And he turned round and his elbow hit this woman right in her chest. Oh, he said, I'm very sorry, my dear. He said, I hope if your heart's as soft as your breast, you'll forgive me. She says, listen now, if the rest of you is as hard as your elbow, I'm in room 27. <laughs> There's two guys from the north of England, Sean and John, they decided to have a weekend's golfing in Scotland. So they got the car filled up with the golf clubs, off they went. And they're halfway up, they're going up the east coast of Scotland, but they, they run into some terrible, a blizzard, terrible weather. They couldn't drive any further. So they saw this light on in a farmhouse. So they drew in and they asked this middle-aged lovely lady came to the door, could we get a bed for the night? She said, I'm sorry guys, I would love to put you up, but I've just recently been widowed and I'm frightened of what the neighbours might think. Well, she said, look, have you got a spare room in the barn? I said, aye. She said, we'll sleep in there and the first light in the morning we'll be away, you'll never know we've been there. So away they went and a lovely weekend golfing back home and about nine months later, <coughs> John got a letter from a lawyer representing this lady. And he went and saw Sean and he said, remember the weekend we had golfing? We stayed in own farmhouse and own barn. You didn't half in the, mid didn't in the middle of the night go and visit her in the farmhouse. Well, Sean was all embarrassed about I'm finding out. And he said, by the way, did you give her my name and address? <laughs> well, he really was embarrassed. He thought John wouldn't find out. He says, how, what's wrong? Well, nothing. She just did left me the firm. <laughs> Teacher asked me, Wally, in class, he says, if a farmer... If there were four, four crows sitting in a fence and the farmer shot one, how many would be left? We well, he says three. He, he says, sorry, left. He says, none. There would be three, but they would fly away. And the teacher says, well, 
I know, but there still would be three, you know. The, 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 you said there were none, but there'd be three. So you got, I think I buggered this up. He said, can I have a wee shot at this? And he said, teacher said, I own you go. There were three women having an ice cream. <laughs> one was licking it, one was biting it, and one was sucking it. What one was married? The teacher was a wee bit embarrassed. She says, I suppose it was the one that was sucking it. He says, no, it was the one wearing the wedding ring, but I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Farmer goes into a local bar and orders a champagne, glass of champagne, and a woman sitting next to him said, how about that? I've just ordered champagne as well. What a coincidence, said the farmer. This is a special day for me. I'm celebrating. This is a special day for me too. I'm celebrating too, as they clink glasses. He said, what are you celebrating? He says, well, we've been trying, me and my husband have been trying to have a family for a year, and today my doctor told me I'm pregnant. Well, the farmer says, that's a coincidence. He says, hey, I'm a chicken farmer. And for the last year, my hens have been unfertile. But they've all started laying again. Well, what a coincidence, says the woman. That's great, says her. And how did your chickens become fertile? Oh, he says, I used a different cock. So she smiled and clinked his glass and says, now that is a coincidence. <laughs> Now, I'm just toasting the club tonight, so I'm not going to go on and go on for too long, but I'd like to finish with a wee story. But the guy's in the pub, and he lays a bit of string in the bar, and he says to the barman, if, that, if I can make that string stand up like that, would you give me a free whiskey? The boy says, if you can make that string stand up like that, I'll give you a bottle of whiskey. So the boy said, man, well, his black pocket, and he brought out a wee flute, and he started playing a tune, and all of a sudden the string went like that. The barman says, there you are, a wee bottle of whiskey. He says, I'll tell you what, I've got a bit of rope in here, about an inch thick. He <coughs> said, if you can make that stand in its end, you've got a case of whiskey. So just at that, you get the wee whistle out again, and this bit of rope went up like that. So he gets a case of whiskey, and he's heading for the door. The wee woman at the door says, can I buy that penny whistle off you for a hundred pounds? <laughs> she says, right, on you go. So she goes, hey, she goes up the stair. And her husband's in bed, so he's outside the bedroom door, starts playing the penny whistle. She opens the door and the blankets are up like this. She threw the blankets back and his pyjama cord's standing up. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've been asked to do a toast to this lovely air curling club, so I'd like you to be upstanding. <laughs> The toast is Air Curling Club. Thank you. A reply to the club this year comes from Mara Lindsay. Mara curled for Fullerton, Troon Portland, Dumellington and Air Curling Club. She was also on Air Curling Club Committee and the Royal Cal Caledonian Curling Club Ladies Standing Committee. She has just returned from the Scottish Ladies Tour of America that took place through October and November uh, of 2022. Mara was a home economics teacher for 36 years, then worked for the Scottish Qualification Authority on a part-time basis for eight years and is due to retire in March. This will allow her more time for other hobbies such as golf and tennis. Ladies and gentlemen, Mara Lindsay. Mr Chairman, honours guests, ladies and gentlemen, the, um, we've had lots of entertaining speeches tonight, I'm sorry, this is a boring one. The, um, on behalf of the members of your curling club, it says here in my notes I'd like to thank Tommy for his kind words. In fact, I'd just like to thank him for his stories. They were very entertaining and I'm glad that I don't have to tell any of them. But on behalf of the curling club, see, he did toast our club and we are all, as members, very, very proud of being members of Air Curling Club. We might not have the newest state-of-the-art ice facilities, in fact, as many of you will know, this site was once a dog track in a previous life, where greyhounds raced. But for the benefit of our American guests, that was a four-legged variety, and not the buses. But that could have been an interesting site. However, I digress. 
Over the last 50 years, and thanks to the efforts of successive boards and committees, we do have the facilities that we enjoy today. We've got a dedicated ice team who work hard to produce good curling ice for us. And, importantly, we have an amazing membership here. They're very inclusive and friendly, and both look out for and look after fellow members. We have, in fact, an international membership. Our Lady Vice President, Lisa, began her curling at St Paul Curling Club in Minnesota, Minneapolis. And I hope that she has had the opportunity to catch up with our two guests who also hail from there. We have around 30 clubs of curl here, ranging from clubs who have been in existence for over 200 years, to those that were only created a few years ago. We have a healthy junior section, which includes a little rocker section for the youngest curl <coughs> curlers, and a thriving gateway club for new curlers. We are privileged to have played our part in the history of the game, and we look forward to the future. As Bobby said, I was very fortunate to be a member of the recent ladies, Scottish Ladies Curling Tour to the United States. On tour we visited 11 states and 14 ice rinks, five of which are represented here tonight by some of our American guests. Indeed we met some of a number of the tour members here tonight on our travels. The friendship and hospitality extended to us throughout was second to none. And I hope that our guests are enjoying the hospitality extended to them during their visit to air, from the members as well as our excellent bar and catering staff. Um, I bet you've never had a podium written for you in, a, in any of your other places so far. That was, a, that was a joy, Simon, thank you. I know from reading your blog that you've been well looked after throughout your travels in Scotland, and now that you're with us in the heart of Burns country, the opportunity to join us in a Burns supper will hopefully leave lasting memories of your time in air. I'd like to ask Ken Ireland, President of Air Curling Club, to toast our Harry's Maxwell Trophy tourists and guests. Ken is a retired sea captain with P&O where he spent 44 <coughs> years between deep sea and ferries. In retirement, Ken has been busy not only at Air Ice Rink, but also find, found time to raise money for the Social Bike Fund by cycling from Glasgow to Edinburgh, 66 miles in total, and raising over £1,000 and ch for charity. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Ireland. Good morning. Mr Chairman, top table guests, our American guests and fellow curlers. When I was selected to play in this event, I was under no illusion that it was my wealth of curling experience that had attracted me to the selectors. <laughs> <laughs> Consequently, as I was sitting in the changing room blazing up my curling shoes, with trepidation of facing these American curling athletes, I related to the first lines of Robbie's well-known poem, To a Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> we, Curran, timorous beastie, oh, what a panic's in thy breastie. <laughs> However, this panic subsided, and I enjoyed a great afternoon's curling, the memory of which I shall cherish for some time. Many presidents and prime ministers have alluded to the special relationship which exists between our two countries. None more so than we have experienced on and off the ice over the previous few days. Although there are several thousand miles of water between our nations across the pond, as you Americans refer to it, this does not deter periodic visits to each other to enjoy curling. On that basis, we look forward to future curling tours in combination with social and cultural exchanges. I would now like to ask Ayrshire Curlers to be upstanding, please, and I propose a toast to our American guests. <laughs> I'd now like to welcome Leland Rich, captain of the American Touring Team, to reply to the toast for the tourists and invite any other tourists to perform their entertainment. So, 
hang on just a second, guys. Uh, so sometimes you step out on the ice and you, you know you're outclassed. I'm outclassed. Good job, guys. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we've been here for two and a half weeks, something like that. We are having an outstanding time. It, uh, the hospitality, the curling, it's just incredible. You know, I've kind of, bear with me a second, and the guys have heard this before. I kind of relate it to uh, the Kranikin that we had for dessert tonight. The first night we were here, I had Kranikin. It's like one of the best desserts I've ever had. I really liked it. I've ordered it somewhere around 14 times since then. <laughs> <laughs> and we got it again tonight. I was quite happy to see that. Every time I get Kranikin, it's different. It's, it tastes kind of the same, but it's a little different. It looks different, and it keeps getting better. I don't know how you do it, but our curling experience is the same thing. We go into a club. All the people are incredibly nice. They're all curlers. That helps. We have a great time whether we win or lose. Um, luckily, we've won a couple more than we've lost, but not today. Um, but it just keeps getting better. Tonight... Simon, thank you very much. That was incredible. Uh, we will all take that. I don't know if one of the guys recorded it, but if not, we're going to figure out how to go back in time and it. do that. You got it? Yep. Thank you. Good man. Um, but it just keeps getting better. The only caveat to that is we're going to entertain you now. <laughs> um, none of us were picked for our entertainment skills. Uh, our, our courier David was there, I believe, when we did it the first time, what is it, 15 days ago? 14 days ago? Thank God you guys weren't. <laughs> We've had 15 tries after that, and it's getting a lot better. <laughs> well, we'll see. So come on up, guys. Let's try it out. Captain from the great white North Hills, he was first 
may build, they throw their stones on the frozen Bering Sea. Wise old curlers and wily skips, their shots are true and straight. That's only cause they learned to curl before Alaska was a state. <laughs> Antarctic keep built many a home, but his curling house ain't sturdy. Scientists both are dark and steep, his friction and that sort. But we're still not sure what draws your teeth. It comes up about 60 short. Ring, ding, 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 Minnesota, our friend Ken Olson is all that state could spare. He loves his rocks and always talks his teammates after sleep. But nothing knocks him up quite like his lectures on how to sleep. Ring, ding, diddle, and lie, yo, the dreams our storms will go. But tramp a scotch up on the bus for girls, we shall know. And I go to boys, Sean and Roger, plainsmen, true and nice. When the harvest done, Sean has his fun making world class ice. Rod's under his name is King, to the counter, sure is not. Their curling tails are just as tall as that fish they almost caught. The ring, ding, 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 Champion curlers can't conduct the limits they almost went. Chrissy loves to play board games and they're all sharks with their cars. And Michael, he will prosecute you if you don't hurry hard. Ring, ding, 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 he built himself a club and now he makes his shots with glee. And Brad and Jeff are curling men from Detroit and Chicago. Their lengths are great, but we hate to say their shots we just don't know. <laughs> ring, ding, do, 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 the rings our stones will go. A tram, a scotch, up on the bus for curlers we shall know. Now last, not least, our boys from the east, curlers, grand and regal. Mike comes from the Big Apple and he's our legal eagle. A gentle soul is weighing by the strings he holds our purse. But I asked him for a penny for scotch and the Lord that boy can curse. Ring, ding, 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 the only trouble with all his guards, they tend to sail right through. And when Peter from the Granite State, he'll win the match himself. Be careful though, cause if you win, he always goes top shelf. <laughs> ring, ding, 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 that nutmeg boy, he shall be missed, cause he really screwed our song. From Caroline, we gained a duck, that's one duck just too many. The professor's here to teach us clear, as he's done for girlers plenty. Ring, ding, 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 the rings our stones will go. A dram of scotch up on the bus, for girlers we shall know. After many a match, our scotch team will play on one last night. We'll pack our bags with memories and head out for our flight. Stones and clubs and body lasses and friendships fill our dreams. And our livers with that glorious scotch, nearly bursting at the seams. Ring, ding, 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 Our hearts are full of memories. And we'll be back in the
going to turn it on. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Just yell. It's appropriate right now, since we spent an extra year before we got to come here. Uh, we were delayed a year because of the pandemic. We lost some people along the way, and now's an appropriate time to mention them. The first person we lost was our convener from Scotland, Clive Thompson. I'm sure many of you knew him. Yes. We then started to lose some tourists. The first one was Joel, who we mentioned in our song. Joel had to stay and take care of a parent. Uh, we also lost Charlie Brown, who's, uh, we have an avatar of Charlie right there. Somebody might want to hold it up. We're not quite sure um, what Charlie's parents were thinking when they named him. But Charlie fully embraced his identity, and I once saw him wearing a t-shirt with that exact stripe on it. Uh, we miss him. He went and curled one night, and he uh, went to bed and didn't wake up. And he was younger than most of us, so that's it's particularly sad. And last, we lost Jeff Kitchens, who we also have an avatar for, who um, his, in about three weeks before we were to leave, his doctor said he couldn't go on this trip for medical reasons. Anyway, I want to uh, make sure that we remember absent friends. And if you have a class, please, I, I'll pretend I have one. Uh, the class raised in absent friends. Now, uh, it turns out several of our tourists claim that they were good at storytelling. So we're going to put a few of them to that test. And I think we're getting a special story today from Ken and Kent, who are going to talk about coming to Scotland. Yes, you are. There you go. Here we are. Yep. I'm Ken. I'm Kent. <laughs> We're both from the St. Paul Curling Club in Minnesota. If you know the United States, Minnesota is central U.S., just below Canada. And we'll talk loud. And if you can't hear us, let us know. We'll turn and try to communicate to everyone. But Kent and I have been playing together since probably 1980. He was a little younger than me, so we didn't uh, play together in juniors, but in men's we played together off and on for a lot of years. A lot of years. Yeah. And so um, we've known each other and we've known each other's families. So uh, Kent and I were talking and decided that we wanted to come over and golf here in Scotland with our fathers before they couldn't walk courses because we wanted to play at least one of the championship courses. So Kent Skett arranged all of this for us played or went to Inverness initially when we came to Scotland for a week, played Royal Dornock. The dads could walk it. They actually, I think, beat us. They beat us. Yeah, <laughs> sure. You know, we're the young guys trying to hit the ball too far, and uh, they're just chunking it down the fairway and scoring really well. Um, and then we came to Ayr, and we finished our tour in Ayr, and we played uh, Glasgow Gales twice. Uh, and it was a wonderful time. Loved the town for when we were here. But we had... Um, our Caddyshack moment, uh, I think it was our first round at Glasgow Gales, and I assume most people have seen Caddyshack. Yes. Um, so we started off uh, that day by driving to the beach, and it was so windy that walking over the dune and down to the beach, we walked backward because the wind coming up the sand dune, it could etch glass. Um, so that was the wind we were going to play with. Started the round, the first six, seven holes were windy, but very playable. And then the rain came, and that was our Caddyshack moment with horizontal rain. Um, and it, it just felt like the minister when he was playing the best round of his life in Caddyshack. The dads were smart. The dads decided, let's go in, we'll have a cocktail. Kent and I, not so smart. We just took the head covers off the golf gloves, put them in the bag, tried to keep our gloves dry, <laughs> and played three or four holes in crazy rain. And then the rain stopped, but the wind didn't. The wind didn't. We're playing the 14th hole, back into the wind. Driver, three wood, three wood. <laughs> Another three wood. <laughs> Eight iron to the green. It was that windy. But we had a wonderful time. But we appreciated, one, how good the professional golfers are to be able to put up a two over, three over round at the open. And 
how good you guys are to play in wind like that. We don't see that. We have trees that knocks down the wind. We don't have to deal with that. Uh, but it was a great time. And my recollection, and it may be totally wrong, but my recollection is the next day, sunny, calm, gorgeous day for golf, totally different than the day before. Um, in Minnesota, we joke about our weather is, you know, just wait a short while and the weather will change. And uh, it, we experience the same thing here. So we want to thank you all for listening to our story, but also on behalf of all of our curlers, bringing us into the burn supper. This is the first for, I think, all of us. And this is memorable. Um, it's part of this whole memory we're going to have. And just thank you. If I might add, real quick, we came to Scotland in 2003. And I'll never forget, it's a couple years after 9-11. And every single place we went to, Scots came to us and said, Thank you. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for doing what you've done. And we sincerely appreciate the friendships we made then and the friendships <coughs> we're making now. So thank you very much. We have the same expression in Seattle about the weather. If you don't like it, wait 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're going to do a little piece now. I'm just going to say, with apologies to Sir Paul. <laughs> <laughs>
young man named Bob Labonte. Uh, he was playing a team out of Canada, skipped by a gentleman named Melanchuk. And in the very, in the last game, in the championship game, and up until this point, Canada had only lost two world championships. Uh, one was to Scotland, and one was to the USA. So they were accustomed to winning, and they were the favored team in this championship. These young upstarts from North Dakota really had no business being in the same sheet of ice as this uh, team from Manitoba. The way it went down was, uh, last in, the Americans were uh, up by two. Melanchuk had a shot for an uh, uh, open hit on the button. If he rolled too far, he would only score one. If he didn't roll too far, he would score two, tie the game. He ended up rolling too far, except the thirds did not have a chance to uh, judge whether or not which stone was closer. The American third went out, looked at the stone, indicated to Bob Labonte, the skip, that he thought it was closer. He acknowledged that. He jumped up in the air. Bob came, came running out on the ice, jumped up in the air, slipped, fell, and kicked the rock. <laughs> so you can still find that video actually uh, on YouTube so you can go back and look at it. And when he kicked that stone, prior to the third degree, they put the rock back and they measured the stone, which you can't do any longer. The rules were changed after this event. Measured the stone, the Canadian rock was closer, went to an extra end. The American boys didn't have the the energy required to win that, so they ended up losing the game. So, what was born out of that by a Canadian sports commentator was the curse of the Labonte. Because Canada had won so many years up until that point, and they'd never lost two years consecutively, it took them until 1980, so another eight years, before they won another world championship. And it took a Manitoba team 23 years. It took them until 1995. Gary Burtnick won in 1995. He was from Manitoba. So all that time, there was this curse of the Labonte floating around the Canadians. Well, back to 1972, Bob is flying home from Germany, that's where the world championships were held, and he gets off the plane in Grand Forks, North Dakota, he's <laughs> taking a bus to his hometown in Grafton, North Dakota, and all the way home, he's worried about what his dad's going to say, because he knew his dad would be listening or watching Winnipeg TV or listening to Winnipeg radio, the two towns are only about 90 miles apart, and uh, pretty nervous. <coughs> He gets home, walks up on the front step, takes a breath, walks into the house. His dad's sitting on the recliner, and his dad said, Bob, who won the world championships five years ago? And Bob said, I don't have any idea. And dad, his dad said, well, son, they'll never forget you. <laughs> <laughs> You're all going to be a little disappointed. It's one of many oh. ducks. So this is a joke <clears throat> told as frequently as we've had Kranikin about 14 times. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to deliver it rapid style in honor of Archie. I'm going to fire it off. It's getting a little late in the evening, so I'm going to fire it off. So I won't require your assistance this time. Okay. Okay. Well, yes, you do. Yes, you do. You're going to get your friends. Woman walks into a pet store, sees a beautiful parrot. Isn't it beautiful? It's only 20 pounds. She walks up to the clerk and she asks, why is this bird only 20 pounds? The clerk says, well, it spent most of its life in a brothel. So she 
turns to the bird, sees how beautiful it is. I mean, it has the colors. The colors. <laughs> the plumage. The plumage. It has a nice shiny beak. Ooh, shiny beak. Shiny beak. Shiny beak. The talons. The talons. 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 <laughs> you know what color parrots' eyes are? Gray. Well, I don't know any more than you do, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do with the punchline. So. <laughs> Uh, so she decides she's going to take it home. She sets it up in the living room. First time she walks in the living room, the parrot goes, Hey, pretty lady. Hey, pretty lady. Her daughters walk in the room. Hey, pretty girls. Hey, pretty girls. Her husband walks in the room. The bird says, Hi, Archie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to close with a song that you all probably know. Uh, the words were written by Russ Armstrong, who was one of the tourists on the last tour in 2012. And I've stolen, I've stolen it in its entirety. Uh, I think we have song sheets we can pass out. Did you hand them out? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, everybody's got them? Go ahead. Please it sing, sing along. Sing louder than us, please. I like to figure out. Your hearts with
first thing, I want to thank all of you for entertaining us, for having, inviting us to come to Scotland, and for uh, helping us on this tour. It's uh, been a lot, and we've done a lot, and we continue to do it. It's great. Thank you all very much. So we have a little gift for the, for the local you. folks. This is a plaque of the United States. It shows all the states that we're from, spread out from coast to coast. And, uh, Again, I just want to say thank you. The experience is incredible. We're having a great time. You know, the uh, we'd all like to thank the ice makers. I don't know if any of them are in here, but the ice in this facility is incredible. The main staff in the kitchen. The food's been incredible for days. For two days, we just are overfed. It's very good. Thank you. Um, and we especially want to uh, thank all the guys that we played out on the ice the last two days. We've had some incredibly close games, and they're a lot of fun. Win or lose, they were great games, and we really enjoyed them. Thank you very much. And one more time, Simon, that was incredible. Good job. I think that we need to make a final shout out to our convener, Alex Dixon, and to our two couriers, one of whom was Bill uh, Ak uh, Arnold. 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 and the other is David McIntyre, who's done a great job. Before the tourists return to their tables, we could please ask Andrew Kerr to come up and present our guests with a token of appreciation and a memento of their time in Ayrshire. Oh, I'll just, you ready? No, you didn't tell me. One at a time. <laughs> Doug Anderson. What? Come on, Barry. Come on, Barry. Bill Grider. Michael Dry. Kate Keith Shriver, Michael Shalom, Roger Smith, Brett Jackson, Peter Lyons, Steve Schaefer. Craig Fisher, Leland Rich, Doug Potter, Chris McMahon, Ken Olson, Jeff Wright, Wayne Anderson, and Dick Brugler. Thank you, Andrew. I'd now like to ask the Scottish Fiddle Orchestra to perform the star of Raddy Burns. And you, there should be song sheets and all the tables are in the books. Please feel free <laughs> to sing along. Thank you.
Scottish Curling Champion in 1985. Well, you did see it, you see it, Billy. Billy Hibbert. Chairman Bobby, Captain Leland, ladies and gentlemen, brother and sister curlers and guests, it's an honour to be here to do the vote of thanks after such a great evening as we've had. So, I've, you hold your applause to the end as the night's going on because I've a good number of people and I'm not going to miss any of them because I think they're all deserving their mention. After two days of curling, a visit to Olympic curling stone manufacturer, a great deal of socialising, a fantastic burn supper there and a great number of people to thank. The directors of Ayrshire Curlers Limited for the sponsorship of the ice, plus freeing up today <coughs> to allow for preparations for this burn supper. Leslie and Aileen in the office, they did a fantastic amount of work through the correspondence and the handling of the burn supper of the finances. Andy Kerr for all his work putting together the Ayrshire Tour booklet and organising the printing of both the booklet and the print. The ice staff led by Liam for the fantastic ice they have provided for us, and indeed have provided all season. Laurie and the Caterham team for their excellent fare accumulating a superb bun supper tonight. Amy who's double, who doubles up as an ice tech and her bar team for their excellent service of keeping us well watered. 
Our visit today, we must thank Kay's Curlin at Mochlin, Sir Jim English, who is the managing director, who is our contact. We thank them very much for an excellent visit, and I'm sure the Americans will now realise how important it is that Kay's at, Cur at Mochlin continues to go supplying our Olympic curling stones. This evening, our Piper Fergus has done a fantastic job as he has over the two days piping on the ice. 14 year old, he managed to skip school this morning. He said it was a, 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 a revelation, he missed chemistry, but he'd have preferred it be an afternoon because he had double maths. <laughs> <laughs> the members of the Scottish Fiddle Orchestra up here have played away there in the background and entertained us tonight. Thank you. Corey Lawrence for dressing the tables with the flowers. Alison Young, our Lady President, for saying grace. The Haggis Born and High by Aileen McCorkle. Piped in again by Fergus. Fantastic little piper. And addressed ably by Neil Sands. Jamie Mason for his interpretation of a immortal memory of Robert Burns. Toasty Lasses by Archie Gilbert and a reply to Liz Goldie. A super recitation of Tama Shanta to Simon Lamb. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I knew that would draw applause. <laughs> <coughs> Toast air curling cub from Tommy Wilson and a reply for Mara Lindsay. Air, air curling club president Ken Ireland for his toast to Harry's Maxwell tourists and guests, and Leland Rich for his reply. <clears throat> Finally, the province organising committee, led by Douglas Reed, who is currently captain the Strathcona Cup East Tour in Canada, but ably deputised this evening with Bobby Island, who has led us since his departure to Canada. They have certainly put the work in to make sure this runs smoothly over this last two days. And I think they're well deserving of a good vote of thanks. Now, I'd like to wish now the US curlers a successful conclusion to their tour. And hopefully you've enjoyed your trip to Ayrshire as much as we have mm -hmm. enjoyed having you here. And we haste you back. If you're back in Ayrshire, we will be delighted to meet you again here in Ayrshire. And I think that's about me finished here, apart from letting you know, hope you all have a safe journey home, not miss one out. Thank you to all the curlers who participated over the two days, the Isher curlers, and I'd just like to let it be known, we'll just put the Americans in their place, we actually came plus four shots. <laughs> That slip. Um, but just basically, a safe journey home for everybody, and the bar is still open, and safe travels to the Americans and the rest of their trip and their journey home. Thank you very much. If we could all go up standing, we'll sing Old Lang Syne.